Good day. My name is Cherise Echo Cooper from the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Threatened Amphibian Program, in which we work towards habitat security for threatened species. Our approach includes collaborative partnerships with stakeholders towards building contextual solutions which support ecological and social resilience. However, in 2020, myself together with Dr. Ian Little, Dr. Lizanne Roxborough, Dr. Jean Terrence, and Nunkule Kunzama and Arlene Mkise learned that a constructivist approach needs to be implemented in conjunction with a compliance strategy to enforce environmental protection that aligns with South Africa's environmental legislation. During this presentation, I will outline an approach developed towards enabling compliance within communities focused at a grassroots level. Environmental governance within the legislative framework is complex and fragmented between different mandated authorities, such as the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, Department of Water and Sanitation, and the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Furthermore, barriers such as lack of capacity and resources hinder compliance and enforcement. In addition, the priority for social development often leaves environmental governance as a lower priority afterthought. Furthermore, the strange relationship between some communities and government institutions has hampered development in this regard. Consequently, lack of environmental governance threatens ecological integrity in areas of biodiversity significance, as well as social and economic well-being. In response, we initiated a six-month pilot project to trial a community grassroots-centered environmental compliance enabling system, which integrated in education towards building knowledge and capacity through internships and mentorships as environmental control officers. Through this education program, ECOs use tools to conduct situational assessments or audits of compliance in their specific communities. Non-compliance records are evaluated using the environmental screening tool to determine impacts which can be used to report to relevant authorities and stakeholders. Two sites were selected to participate in the study, namely Adams Rural and Norman Dean, which are both based in KwaZulu-Natal. Although both of these sites are within municipal areas, Adams Rural falls within a traditional management authority, while Norman Dean is directly governed by a Majuba district municipality. Both these sites are of biological and ecological importance in that they contain critically endangered habitat and form part of strategic water resource areas. In addition, species such as the endangered Pickersgill's reef frog and clue frogs are located in Adams Rural and the endangered ROB and secretary bird, as well as the vulnerable African grass owl, can be found in Norman Dean. Four modules were developed for the Introduction to Environmental Legislation in South Africa course and included the National Environmental Management Act, Water Act, Waste Act and Biodiversity Act. In each module, learners are required to orientate themselves around the various environmental legislative acts and provide contextual examples from their communities to illustrate the relevance of the act's contents. Overall, three learners participated in the course, achieving an average score of 69%. The course has been aligned with the South African Qualifications Authority and is being submitted for accreditation. Through accreditation, participants that complete the course receive credits towards a qualification in a certificate in environmental management. To support the qualified environmental compliance officers, tools were developed to assist the ECOs to conduct situational assessments to understand the state of compliance within their specific communities. This was achieved by amalgamating limited activities within the various environmental legislation acts, which were aligned with themes such as agriculture and buildings, for example. ECOs conducted patrols and then captured acts of non-compliance on the app, which is then stored in a central database. For our purposes, monthly reports were compiled to determine areas of concern. For Adams Rural, it can be seen that the building theme is of great concern, while the water theme is a concern for the Norman Dean area. Through the data capture, compliance issues are listed according to the specific restricted, limited or controlled activities as outlined in the legislation. In relation to the themes of concern for each site, it can be noted that any activity within 32 metres of a watercourse and the construction of dams is of specific concern in relation to the legislation. Authorities are then able to interpret non-compliance and conduct investigations accordingly. 
Reporting and networking culminated the education resource strategy in which environmental compliance officers were able to identify, communicate and report in a meaningful way to management authorities. Through this process, compliance issues of key concern were prioritised according to the impact as described in the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment's Environmental Screening Tool reports. Relevant mandated authorities were identified and compliance issues were logged and tracked. Different approaches were used in consultation with management authorities. These included notices to landowners, educational posters, formal notification to authorities, as well as comments on various development applications. A database of authorities was established for each area and included sectors, various sectors, including public, private and civil organizations or institutions. This facilitated efficient logging of complaints and responses. The fragmentation of communication in institutions both within and between authorities is the greatest hindrance towards effective compliance and enforcement. This coupled with the gap in understanding on the repercussions of environmental non-compliance in relation to social and economic well-being is further depreciating the value of environmental legislation in South Africa. However, the system has the potential to support authorities through prioritization of compliance towards effective enforcement while increasing knowledge and capacity within different levels of communities may increase support for environmental governance. We hope to expand this project in areas with key ecological and biodiversity importance in conjunction with the existing conservation projects to ensure effective protection of ecological infrastructure and related good, goods and services. I thank you for your time and would like to take the opportunity to thank Rand Merchant Bank or RMB for their financial support as well as all our stakeholders who participated in this project.